So let's get down to business. Translation. And like I said before, transcription, translation, they sound a lot alike, and it's easy to goof them up. But they're really quite different things. And so uh, we want to keep them straight. The way I, like I said, I remember transcription is easy. You're just copying over. Translation is actually a more challenging thing, like translating from English to French or something. So today I want to talk about how that works. As a reminder, that's making protein based on, on the mRNA sequence. So to be clear, oftentimes we'll say we're making protein from RNA or making, um, turning protein, uh, RNA into protein, and that's not what we're doing. We are reading the RNA and using that information to generate a protein. Right? It's not a chemical conversion, it's a reading operation. So, in the same way we talked about it before, the mRNA and the protein, you made a little table, mRNA has four letters. How many letters in the protein alphabet? How many amino acids do we worry about? A lot, right. It, there, it turns out there's 20. I'm, a really, I'm really sorry about the noise. There's nothing I can do about this because if I take this off, you can't hear me. So I'm sorry about the huge explosion sounds. Um, hopefully they will go away. Um, there are 20 letters in the protein alphabet. They are, uh, in, in mRNA, it's A, G, C, and U. And here it's ala, veil, lice, etc. 20 different ones, it turns out. They're one strand in RNA and one strand in protein. That makes things a little simpler. This goes from 5 prime to 3 prime, and this goes from amino to carboxyl. Okay. A couple things. This is done by a thing called a ribosome. Okay. And that is a complex of protein and what's called rRNA, ribosomal RNA. So if you were going to be consistent in how you named that, you'd call it protein polymerase. Right? The thing is, it turns out, historically speaking, they discovered ribosomes long before they knew what they did, because they're actually quite large as cellular organelles go. So there were these things called ribosomes. Ribo, because it contained a lot of RNA, ribonucleic acid. We now call that the rRNA, the ribosomal RNA. Later on, they figured out that those things are actually where proteins are made. So they have a sort of archaic name. Um, the other thing is, because there's a different number of letters, the translation can't be as simple as transcription. Transcription, it was just every time you see an A, you're going to pair a T, etc. Right? That's easy. One for one letter. In this case, you've got a four-letter alphabet you're trying to turn into a, a 20-letter alphabet. So you can't read one for one. So therefore, you need to read the mRNA in groups of nucleotides. These are called codons. Okay. And you can actually do a little bit of math. And this is one of the kind of cool things. The number of nucleotides um, per group that is per codon, okay. and the number of amino acids that can be specified. Right. And this must be, be at least 20 for all 20 amino acids. All right. So if you have one nucleotide per codon, you can specify four different amino acids. You could have an amino acid for A, one for G, one for C, and one for T. That's only four amino acids. That's nowhere near the 20 that you need. So what about if, uh, what about if you had two nucleotides per group? Well, then you could have a A, a, a G, a C, and a U. G, 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 C, G, G, and G, U, etc. If you work out the math on that, it's 4 times 4 
is 16 possible amino acids. Both of these are too few. They're not enough for the 20 amino acids you need. If, if you have, on the other hand, you do three, it's four times four times four is 64, which is more than enough. And this is one of those cool things. Lots of times, biology is just so. It's the way it is. You have to live with it. It doesn't always make sense, but that's the way it is. This is one of those few things where it actually makes sense. That is the smallest number, the smallest possible size for a codon that can encode all the different 60, uh, 30, 20 amino acids is three nucleotides. And it could have been that it were there 27 long, but there's lots of extra, right? But it turns out, in this one particular case, three is exactly right. That is, three is just what you need, or it's a little more. It gives you more than enough capacity, but that's the way it is actually in real life. Therefore, there are three mRNA nucleotides per codon. Codon. And again, it didn't have to be sort of as neat as that. Uh, and when the Watson and Crick and all their buddies were working on this, they thought, huh, wouldn't it be cool if it was three? The math would work out kind of nicely. And it turns out that it does. It didn't have to, but it, it turns out that it does. Um, so the other thing you need, so as we'll see, CCC encodes proline. You need some way to go from the RNA world, CCC, to the amino acid world. And people had lots of weird ideas back in the day that they thought perhaps that the RNA had a particular shape, so only the right amino acid would plug in. Except you can't make that work. It just won't, the shapes aren't right and they're not versatile enough. So you had to have something more, something a little bit different. And this was actually proposed by Francis Crick of Watson and Crick. He proposed that there was going to have to be an adapter. So you also need an, a nucleotide to amino acid adapter. Because all, right? all these things work by base pairing. So you've got to have some kind of molecule that has one end that can base pair and another end that has an amino acid hanging off of it. And that's going to, that was, so Crick said you're going to have to have something like that and they went and they looked and it turned out they found it. This is the thing that's called tRNA, which is, or transfer RNA. And there's about 64 different kinds right, because of the 64 different codons. It's slightly more complicated than that, but that's a bad, not a bad place to start. And if you look at what a tRNA looks like, let me give myself a little bit more space. If you got your mRNA, five prime end out here, da 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 da, and you've got a little bit of sequence, da 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 da, to the three prime end, say you have a. C, C. That's the codon you want to read. Well, your tRNA has to base pair that. It's going to have to have a G, G, U. And in fact, for honest to God base pairing, this end has to go off to the five prime end. These things have to be anti-parallel. And this, t this tRNA molecule is base paired to itself in very complicated ways. Um, and then at the three prime end, there's an oxygen atom, and there'll be the amino acid attached. I'm going to do this in red. Okay. And so this whole thing is the tRNA um, with the specific amino acid attached. Okay. And the idea is that, so for every codon, the cell has to make a separate tRNA, in fact, many copies of the same molecule, with the ability to bind to it the, the three nucleotides that encode that amino acid, and hang it off the other end is the actual amino acid itself. So this is an adapter between the RNA world and the protein world. So how does translation work? Base pairing, right? Because you've got base pairs down here. I'll draw them in and... Um, in some color, let's do it in green. There are base pairs. So one end of this molecule base pairs with the RNA, and the other end um, with the codon, and the other end has the, R, has the amino acid in, in question attached. 
Questions about that guy before we talk about details of how the whole process really works? Okay. So the other thing you're going to need, like all these processes, also you need a start and stop signals like transcription. That is, all of these processes have a start signal and an end signal. So the thing knows where to do its job. Okay. And that was the analogy thing that we talked about at, for the clicker question. So what I want to do now is take you step by step through the process, and then we'll talk about details. So the process looks something like this. Number one, the ribosome starts at uh, the start codon. We'll talk about which, what that is in a second. Start closest to the five prime end of the mRNA. So the mRNA is red, five prime to three prime. The ribosome grabs on the end and rolls along, grabs on the five prime end and rolls along until it sees the first start code. And we'll talk about that this in just a sec. And then the tRNA with the proper amino acid base pairs with the mRNA, the messenger RNA, and then number three, the amino acid is added to the protein as it, the chain grows, and the mRNA is red, five prime to three prime. The protein is made amino tricarboxyl. So that's the that's why we I made a fuss about the amino tricarboxyl direction because we usually write protein sequences amino terminus to carboxyl terminus because that's the direction they're actually made, the way they're synthesized and how they'll line up with the RNA. So we keep our sequences aligned. And then the, um, the ribosome advances three nucleotides and this process repeats. And you basically repeat that until you run into at the stop codon mRNA and the protein are released and as a note the protein folds as it is made okay so I'll show you an animation in a second, but what I picture is, I don't know if you guys ever played with Play-Doh when you were a little kid, those sort of fuzzy pumper things, you know, you push the lever and the Play-Doh comes squeezing out. Well, that's kind of what happens. So the ribosome squeezes the protein out. And as it comes out, it folds up in all those ways we talked about, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, hydrophobic interactions, et cetera. All right. What I want to direct your attention to is there in, in today's information packed handout, there's a bunch of still frames from some of those animations. And I'm going to show you an animation just for a second to rem remind you where you are, where we are in the process. And then I want to show you uh, an animation of translation uh, to sort of make this process a little bit clearer. So give people a chance to write that stuff down and find the handouts. And then I'll um, play, the, play the movies. OK. So this one. So this is our general central dogma thing. We start with DNA, because that's what genes are made of. Right? The first step was what we talked about on Wednesday. You peel the strands apart, and you're going to copy one of them into mRNA. You're going to transcribe one. And this shows a strand going away. It doesn't really go away. It's sort of ignored for the moment. Right? Because remember, transcription is not trying to copy everything just this one gene of interest. So it copies this one gene into mRNA, transcription. We talked, like I said, talked about Wednesday. How does it work? Base pairing, right? Base comes in, base pairs and joins, base pairs and joins. How, how do, why, does it, how, why does it not make the wrong sequence? Because the wrong base won't base pair. 
um, and then the RNA gets peeled off. And what this doesn't show is the DNA is then going to reform. The, the Z DNA helix will zip back up. The RNA comes out of the RNA polymerase. And then the ribosome chunks along, reading them in groups of three, that's what we're talking about now, and makes the protein. And those are the amino acids, one amino acid for every three nucleotides in the RNA. So that's the sort of big picture of where we're at. Now, if we want to zoom in on translation, this animation is a bit more complicated than we need, but it contains various important pieces. So this big thing is going to be the ribosome. It turns out the ribosome assembles out of many big pieces on the RNA. So first of all, some pieces come in which you will not worry about, initiation factors, they call them, to start the translation description pro process. All right, so here you got the RNA. All right, so the backbone and the various bases sticking out, single-stranded. This doesn't show the start code on very well, but it shows how the process basically works. So what happens is this bad boy up here is the tRNA. Why is it all coiled up like that? It's like a protein, right? It folds up. It's a single strand of RNA, but what makes it fold up is not hydrophobic interactions like we're used to. It's actually base pairing. It doesn't show it here, but these loops are held together because there are, this is an RNA and has nucleotides sticking out, and they actually base pair with themselves, and it gives it a simple structure based entirely on base pairing. And here, this is what's called the anticodon. It's going to pair with the uh, um, RNA by regular base pairing, and that's the amino acid. And there are enzymes in the cell that ensure that the right amino acid gets stuck on the right tRNA. So this is going to come in, and how does the right one come in? Basically, the one that base pairs is the only one that can stay, so it comes in and sticks by base pairing. The ribosome assembles, and then one by one, new tRNAs come in. And this makes it sort of look choreographed, like only the right one comes in, right? But in fact, lots of the wrong ones come in and they get bounced out because they don't base pair. Only the one that can base pair properly will stay. And then there's sort of a very subtle detail. I wish this animation was a little bit lighter. But the thing to watch now, here's the amino acid from the first tRNA. Here's the amino acid on the second tRNA. There's going to be a switcheroo as we assemble the protein. They transfer over. Shoop, and now you've got a protein with two amino acids, and a new tRNA has come in. And you go along, it shoots along, the third amino acid gets added. So that was the first one in the chain, second one, third one, fourth one, so amino terminus, et cetera, et cetera. You add more and more RNAs. And at each step along the way, let me back it up one second, at each step along the way, the empty tRNAs come out. So ones that are called charged, ones with amino acids come in, once they've dropped their amino acid off, they're spit out by the ribosome, and they get recycled. So the enzyme, the proper enzyme comes along and sticks a new amino acid on that so it can go around again. And so then this thing goes sort of chugging along, three nucleotides at a, at a, a step, adding amino acids to the protein one by one. Base pair and join, base pair and join, except it's three at a time now instead of one. And then it rolls along doing its thing. And then what they do is they zoom out, and what's interesting is you can actually have several ribosomes reading the same RNA, kind of one after the other. The one at the front will have the longer protein, because it's been on longer, and then the ones, for, the ones behind it will be less far, less far advanced. Let me back that up and let it um, play one more time. Questions about how, what, what's going on here? Yeah. Why does the protein... So why does, the, why does the, so why does one amino acid get joined onto the other? So there's two ways to look at why that happens. First of all, if you didn't do that, you wouldn't make a protein, right? But, the, uh, but the, and what the ribosome does is do some little bit of chemistry to make that to join those amino acids together so that they become a protein chain. So because remember the protein chain is a bunch of covalently bonded amino acids. You actually got to nail them together with a covalent bond. And so what hap that's where the where the peptide bond gets formed is like right at that instance, that little sort of, right, if you look in, right up in there is where that peptide bond is going to form. And so, boink, you know, there wasn't there, and now, ping, now they're bonded together, right? And so now you've got a two, two amino acid chain, then you'll have a three and a four. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Where do the tRNAs get the amino acid from? That's a cool question. There are enzymes which recognize the tRNA, and they can read the, ant the anticodon and know, oh, this is the right one, and then they stick the appropriate amino acid on. So for each tRNA, there's actually an enzyme whose job it is to stick the right amino acid on. Um, 
other, yeah. Does the ribosome pause on each codon? Yes. Um, that's right. As far as I know, it kind of sits there, does its thing, and then goes ka-chunk three at a time. That's right. It will not move unless it gets the proper amino acid. That's absolutely right. So, for example, if you don't have enough of the... Suppose you have to put a tryptophan in there, and you don't have enough tryptophan, the ribosome will stop and wait for a tryptophan tRNA to come in. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, the beginning, they show there's two colored balls going at the beginning. There are protein factors that get the whole thing started. We won't sweat about them, but that, that's, the ribosome is actually a very complicated thing. Other questions? Yeah, Raquel. So what happens to the tRNA after it loses the amino acid? It gets recycled. It gets recharged. The enzymes grab it and stick it, the proper amino acid back on again so it can get reused. Right. All right. So that takes care of that, takes care of that. Okay, cool. So what I want to direct your attention to now is the actual genetic code. So if you go to the next page of today's information packed handout, you'll see something like that. Um, and so... There's a couple things to notice. What does this tell you? Every amino acid has a... Co this is the codon and the amino acid. So if there's an AUA in the mRNA, that encodes IL, isoleucine. ACA, threonine, etc. So this is the table. And if you count them up, there's 64 different codons. It shows all the possible combinations of three A, C, U's, and G's. And it lists out the 20 amino acids. All right. So there's a couple things to know about this. Um, number one is this guy. Actually, let me do this in color. This is the start codon. Right, it's AUG, and it starts translation, and also encodes an amino acid, methionine. All right, that's number one. All right. Now um, there are also three stop codons. And what this, it, this says is stop translation and there's no amino acid added. All right. So, before we go further, um, let's take a second and look at this. There's some other things about this, too. You have 20 amino acids, 64 codons. There's going to be some duplicates. So take a second. There's two things. I want to look at with your neighbor and uh, I'll call on people's names. Which amino acids have, like, the, have the most codons for them? And there's one amino acid, um, or there's a couple amino acids that have a very few number of codons. So take a minute, look at the table. Tell me, find me an amino acid that has a very large number of codons for it and one that has a very small number of codons. So talk to your neighbor, and we'll call names, um, and get started, and do all that. All right. So whoever I call, you get to pick. The first person gets to pick whether you're doing a large number or a small number. But um, all right, so get a consensus on one or the other, and we'll uh, call a name. So Kyle, Sweezy, Kyle. Yeah, Kyle, tell me, sir, you want a large number or a small number? What do you want to do? I'll do large. Uh, for large, tell me, what's got a lot of codons? Uh, alanine. alanine has a lot. How many?
Four, all right, so, so the, the, if there are many, like alanine, thank you, sir, uh, which have four codons. This is, so it's redundant. This is four codons. We can do better than just four. Yeah? So bigger one, go for it. Arginine, yeah, arg has got how many? Six, right? So arg has got six, these four and these two, right? So R just got six, all right? There's another one out there that's got a lot, yeah. Leucine has got six also. There's a lot that have four, a decent number that have two, all right? How about the small numbers? Let me give, let me give a chance to give somebody some credit for this. How about a small number? Adrian, 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 are you here? Adrian, tell me, somebody's got a small number. Methionine has got only one, okay. How about another one that's got only one? Yeah. Tryptophan, right? So that there's some that are only one. So thank you, Adrian. Um, let me do that in a different color. So the green one, this one has only one. And trip has only one. All right. So, all right, if that happens to be the way it is. Questions about that before we go one more step? Yeah, in the blue. Why are that some have more and some have less? It isn't clear. Um, for a time, it was thought to be sort of an accident. It actually turns out that some folks, I'm doing a little bit of this research myself, other people have done lots of research on this. There's reason to believe that this is actually not an accident, that it's actually evolved in a way to make the effects of mutations smaller, that the code is laid out in a non-random way. At this point, it's not obvious why. The, different, the reasons are fairly subtle, but it's, there's a chance that it's not random. At the first, to first approximation, there's no particular reason. It turns out leucine is one of the most common amino acids in proteins and has a lot of codons, and tryptophan is rare, but arginine is also rare, so it's not really clear. Yeah? Why is there one start and three stops? Again, I don't know. Um, I don't think it is known. Um, it's also another really good question. Yeah. Wait, let me talk about that in one sec. All right, so what he asked, because I didn't want to give this away, is my next question is, given the rules about start and stop codons, what can you, and this is a talk to you and everything, what can you tell me about the beginning, the amino terminal amino acid of every protein on Earth, if anything, and what can you tell me about the carboxyl terminal, the last amino acid, the first and last amino acid in every protein in the world? Is there anything, given what I've just said up here, you can say about either or both of them? Can they be any amino acid, or is there some restriction? So can it be any amino acid or some restriction for the N terminus, the first one, and is there any restriction on what would be at the C terminus. So think about it, talk to your neighbor. Given what I said about the way start and stop codons work, is there anything you can say? All right, so get a consensus. Uh, we'll get, and the first person I call gets to pick, you know, start or end. All right, so let's see. Drew Rashardi. Drew, are you here? Drew, so tell me, what do you want to pick, the start or the end? So tell me about the start then. Is there any restriction on it? It will always be methionine. Absolutely, Drew's got it right on the money. Because the start code encodes methionine, every single protein is born with methionine at its end terminus, as, as, you, as you asked. That's exactly right. right? Because a start codon happens to encode an amino acid, every protein starts with met. That's the, that's the, the truth. All right, that's the story. All right, so therefore, all proteins start with methionine at their end terminus. OK. 
Okay. All right. So what about the C terminus? Let me pick somebody. Sophia. Sophia, are you here? Sophia. Oh, there you are. Hi, Sophia. Sorry. So, can you say anything about the end, the C terminus, the end of the protein? No. I see you said no very quietly. That's absolutely right. It can be any amino acid. Because basically you roll along, you start with a start codon, methionine, methionine, alanine, leucine, blah, 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 blah. You put the last amino acid in. It can be anything. And then you put a stop codon. And then it stops. So she's absolutely right. You can have any amino acid you like at the C terminus. So thank you. So and can end with any amino acid at the C terminus. Okay. That's kind of big, so I want to make sure there are no questions about that. But it's a direct consequence of the way the code works. Okay. I want to draw a little cartoon of this process, and then I want to do an example, because that's the best way to really make sure that you understand what's going on. So here we go. So an example. Right. A simple gene. Okay. So the gene itself is, as always, DNA. And there's a five five prime end and a three prime end and a five prime end and a three prime end. All right. And you're going to have at one end um, promoter. Talked about the last time that says start making RNA, and at the far end you're going to have a terminator. Okay. And then what's going to happen is transcription is going to make your mRNA, which extends from just after the promoter to just before the terminator. Five prime, three prime. This is the mRNA, as it would have been shown in the um Gene X, and that also has somewhere along here a start codon, which is not the same sequence as a promoter, and a stop codon down here, which is not the same sequence as a terminator. And then the next step, I'm out of cool colors, I guess I'll just use blue. Bless you, translation makes a protein. And it's shorter because it was one amino acid for every three nucleotides in the RNA. So that's your basic sort of cartoon of how the gene does its thing. A couple things to bear in mind, which are sort of counterintuitive at first. Remember, we're not transcribing all the DNA, just the gene we care about. So there's DNA on either end that we are not transcribing. We are not even translating all the RNA. There are typically leaders and trailer regions with a little bit of RNA that's not transcribed. I mean, why not have your start code on right at the beginning? And why not have your stop code on right at the end? The answer is, from the point of view of Bio 111, there's no explanation for that. In real life, the sequences before the start and after the stop are involved in regulation, controlling when this gene is expressed and in what cells and in what parts of the cell. So it's actually, in real life, it's important, even though it's not obvious at the, where we were talking about. Questions about that before we do an example. Okay. So if you turn to the next page of today's information packed handout, it will look something like this. So putting it together. Okay. So you got a DNA, you got a promoter, you got a start of the RNA, blah, blah, blah. First question, talk to your neighbor. Given that information, are you going to make RNA A? or RNA B. We'll talk protein in a second. This is, this is sort of a review from last time. Which RNA are you going to make uh, and why? Why can you only make one, the same drill? Uh, so think about it, talk to your neighbor or call names. If you make an RNA A or RNA B, 